please turn to chapter four at this time and look for the metaphor that is in the beginning of chapter four. Can you can you find it? Human stew that had been boiling. Human stew that had been boiling. Does it say all day? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Underline that, please. So, what an unlikely comparison. Human stew that had been boiling all day. What's being compared to stew that had been boiling? Yeah, who is this? The stew. Yeah, what do we what word do we call for the people in the courtroom? Blood. 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 That they're there, they paid money. We call them yeah, blue flies in chapter three, but what do we call people who pay money? What? Spectators. Okay, so good job. Spectators. This this is telling us that all the spectators are now leaving the courtroom. And this is a really good job. Because oh. our speaker wasn't on. But it was just done. Is it dead? No. I think it just turned out. Too late, Tori. From the dimly lighted passages of the court, the last sediment of the human stew that had been boiling there all day was straining off when Dr. Manette, Lucy Manette's daughter, Mr. Norrie, the solicitor for the defense and its counsel, Mr. Stryber, stood gathered round Mr. Charles Darnay, just released, congratulating him on his escape from death. Is that the end of the paragraph? Yes. Okay, I'm trying to get in my book to the right page. So this is important because we are going, we are about to get an up close look at all of these people as they high five Mr. Darnay, hooray, you're not gonna die today after all. They're standing around in a little circle and I want to make sure that you are following this. It would have been difficult by a far brighter light to recognize in Dr. Manette, intellectual of face and upright of bearing, the shoemaker of the garret in Paris. Yet no one could have looked at him twice without looking again even though the opportunity of observation had not extended to the mournful cadence of his low, gray voice and to the abstraction that overclouded him fitfully without any apparent reason. While one external cause, and that a reference to his long, lingering agony, would always, as on the trial, evoke this condition from the depths of his soul, it was also in its nature to arise of itself and to draw a gloom over him as incomprehensible to those unacquainted with his story as if they had seen the shadow of the actual Bastille thrown upon him by a summer sun when the substance was 300 miles away. So that paragraph is telling us that most of the time, unless you knew him and his history, you would never be able to look at Dr. Manette and imagine that he had undergone such a, an unjust, unfair 18-year-old, 18-year imprisonment. You would never be able to tell because now he has 100% fully recovered. Yes, his hair is still white, but otherwise he is a very robust, healthy man. However, that paragraph also told us that from time to time, he is su susceptible to periods of depression. That's what draw a gloom over him. And it's going to tell us that most of the time, Lucy is able to pull him out of that funk that he gets into almost always, but not every time. So let's get ready to underline. Only his daughter had the power of charming this black brooding from his mind. She was the golden thread that united him to a past beyond his misery and to a present beyond his misery. And the sound of her voice, the light of her face, the touch of her hand, had a strong beneficial influence with him almost always. Okay, so that whole sentence that you underlined, that is a reference, do you remember the title of book the second? Right. The golden thread, that's right. So the golden thread is her hair, but more importantly, symbolically, she is connecting him from his past, giving him a happy future. So that's a reminder of how important she is in resurrecting him. Not absolutely always, 
for she could recall some occasions on which her power had failed, but they were few and slight, and she believed them over. Mr. Darnay had kissed her hand fervently and gratefully, and had turned to Mr. Stryber, whom he warmly thanked. Okay, so Mr. Darnay, how old is he? Uh, 25. 25. 25. Who is he? <laughs> yes, he was the prisoner, and now he is a free man. So he kisses her hand fervently and gratefully. Which word tells us that he likes her? Fervently. That's right. Because fervently implies more than just a single peck on the hand. Maybe a, I don't know, but fervently, <laughs> right? So we know that he likes her. Go ahead and circle Mr. Striver. He is, where do we know this guy from? Just, was he my lawyer? He's the attorney. Yes, he's the defense attorney. Good. In everything that you're going to underline in this paragraph about Mr. Striver, lets us know that Charles Dickens does not like this character because of the way he draws him. It's very interesting. Overall, he characterizes Mr. Striver as being a rude and crude person who is climbing the ladder of success. So get ready to underline quickly. Mr. Striver, a man of little more than 30, but looking 20 years older than he was, stout, loud, red, bluff, and free from any drawback of delicacy, had a pushing way of shouldering himself, morally and physically, into companies and conversations that argued well for his shouldering his way up in life. Okay, so I also want you to draw a box around drawback of delicacy. Draw a box around drawback of delicacy. A drawback is a disadvantage. And so Mr. Dickens, Charles Dickens, is using this tongue in cheek, that means facetiously, about Mr. Stryver. Stryver. He's saying, oh, that's on camera. He's saying he's free from any disadvantage of politeness, right? Draw back from delicacy. That, that term is going to be really important in a future chapter. So I wanted to draw your attention to it. All that to say that Mr. Stryver is just really rude. Um, He's 30 years old, but he looks and acts like a 50-year-old, just in the way that he's obnoxious. Now, if you think about how authors choose their names for their characters, what do we think about striving? Where are you striving? A for person who strives for success. for success. They're climbing that ladder of success. Well, Mr. Striver is the type that would be kicking off other people from that same ladder, right? He's going to shoulder himself. That means be pushy into conversations and push other people out. Okay, that's what, it, that's what you're about to see. He still had his wig and gown on, and he said, squaring himself at his late client to that degree that he squeezed the innocent Mr. Lorry clean out of the group. I'm glad to have brought you off with honor, Mr. Darnay. It was an infamous prosecution, grossly infamous, but not the less likely to succeed on that count. You have laid me under an obligation to you for life, in two senses, said his late client, taking his hand. I have done my best for you, Mr. Donnelly, and my best is as good as another man's, I believe. It clearly being incumbent on someone to say, much better, Mr. Lorry said it, perhaps not quite disinterestedly, but with the interested object of squeezing himself back again. Do you think so? said Mr. Stryver. Well, you have been present all day, and you ought to know, you are a man of business, Okay, so did you notice, and you probably, it's okay if you didn't notice, because this is your first time to read this. I've read this like over a hundred times. But here we see two opportunities. Mr. Stryver is kind of fishing for compliments. I don't know if you could tell that. But the first thing he says is, well, I'm glad I got you off the hook, Mr. Darnay. And okay, so then Darnay says, oh yes, yes, thank you, sir. You know, I'm very grateful to you, very obligated for life. And then Mr. Shriver says again, well, I just have done my best for you and I believe my best is as good as another's. You, you get how that's um, fishing for compliments? Humble, but, you know, Do what? He's trying to act humble, but you know. I guess so, yes. <laughs> and okay, so here's what I wanna ask. Does he give any credit to anybody else for getting 
the defendant off the hook. No. no. Should he? Yes. yes. A little bit? Yeah. Yes. I think the whole reason the defendant was not convicted was because of Lucy. what? Lucy's. 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 Not Lucy's. Oh, no, testimony. The, the, the man that was staring at the ceiling. He looked so nice. The man who was staring at the ceiling, remember? When he writes on a piece of paper, the defendant like, looks like me. me. And that is what got him off because then the the eyewitness who says he saw this man at the hotel giving lists of papers, he can't be sure that that was the man after all. Does that make sense? Yes. So never does Mr. Stryver give any credit to anyone else as you, as you see. Okay. Now, Pay attention because we are about to see the read the most important paragraph in the whole book. Yes, you heard that right. And as such, quoth Mr. Lorry, whom the counsel learned in the law had now shouldered back into the group, just as he had previously shouldered him out of it, as such, I will appeal to Dr. Manette to break up this conference and order us all to our homes. Miss Lucy looks ill. Mr. Darnay has had a terrible day. We are worn out. Speak for yourself, Mr. Lorry, said Stryver. I have a night's work to do, yes? Speak for yourself. I speak for myself, answered Mr. Lorry, and for Mr. Darnay, and for Miss Lucy. And, Miss Lucy, do you not think I may speak for us all? He asked her the question pointedly, and with a glance at her father. His face had become frozen, as it were, in a very curious look at Darnay, an intent look, deepening into a frown of dislike and distrust, not even unmixed with fear. With this strange expression on him, his thoughts had wandered away. Okay, so now we need to act this little scene out so that you really understand the importance of what you just read. Tyler, I need you to come up here. Okay. I trust your acting ability. Why? Uh, Dylan, I don't know. Dylan, come up here. I don't necessarily trust your acting ability, <laughs> but you're going to, here, you get over here. Uh, you get over there on that side. Okay, so I'm not dragging everybody up here who's in this little congratulatory party, but I'm going to name them for you, and you tell me who's missing. This is Charles Darnay, the 25-year-old prisoner who is now a free man. This is Dr. Manette. So in the same little party, uh, we have, who else? Who's Mr. Stryver. Mr. Stryver. Lucy. 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 Uh, Mr. Lori. Mr. Lori. Okay. So it's made up of those five people. You're exactly right. Now, Dylan, all you have to do is just stand here. Okay? But don't 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 cheer go. Just stand there. <laughs> Release prisoner. Okay. Now, Tyler, you are Dr. Manette. And we are going to read this paragraph again now that we can see it after acted out. Dr. Manette's face had become frozen, as it were. And you're, you're looking straight ahead, but you are looking at Charles Darnay here. <laughs> Tyler, you're going to smile, aren't you? Y'all stop laughing. You can't keep it straight. Okay. Away. Yes. Let's not laugh. So it'll be easier for Tyler. Okay. So in a very curious look at Darnay, an intent look deepening into a frown of dislike, distrust, not even unmixed with what? Fear. Fear. Now, <laughs> okay, um, Tyler, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, um, I'm, I'm really hoping you can look afraid which is a very strong okay okay well okay so here's what we need to um think y'all may sit down because you need to underline with your book here okay so take your red pen and this is the most the most important paragraph in the entire book really you don't know why yet but it is so it's saying, it underlined in a very curious look at Darnay. 
underlined in a very curious look at Darnay, then underlined frown of dislike and distrust with fear. Now, how old is Charles Darnay? 25. And how old is Dr. Manette? He was 45 when the book opened. He's 50. So why would a 50-year-old man be looking at a 25-year-old guy with dislike, distrust, and fear? Cindy? What if he thinks that he can take Lucy away from him? Okay, that's a good, reasonable inference to make because maybe he saw that fervent kiss while they go on the hand, right? Okay, so that might explain the dislike. Maybe some of y'all have older siblings and uh, your brother or sister has wanted to marry someone that the parents didn't approve of. That could definitely be dislike on the face, distrust, yes, but would it be fear? Probably not. Okay, well put your hands down. I don't want your guesses. I just want you to be thinking. Are the wheels turning? Yep. So who has, well, I don't want to ask because then you'd feel dumb and there's no reason to feel dumb if you have no idea, okay? So I don't want you to feel dumb, but I do want you to keep this in mind because it is the most important paragraph in the book because it establishes the overarching mystery of this book. It's an absolute mystery that will not be solved until the very end. Because there's no reason why a 50-year-old, trust me, 50-year-old men are not afraid. They're not afraid of 25-year-old men, I need to tell you that, okay? So there's no, we, we are supposed to be really curious. So put with your green pen, C for clue, and draw a great big star by that paragraph because it is hugely important. We, because see, this is the first time that Dr. Manette has ever seen Charles Darnay up close, right? He was sitting pretty far away from him at the trial. You got it, Eva? I don't even want to call on you. <laughs> okay, and y'all just keep it, keep it in your head if you think you know why. I don't think that y'all should know why. No, I don't want to hear what it says. Is it his child? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Would he be afraid of his child? No. 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 His child? Who's his child? Lucy. 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 Okay. Um, yes, okay. okay. All right. Well, see, it's okay. It's okay because we're all just in this together. Here we go. Are we ready to continue? Yes, yes ma'am. So, uh, so Mr. Lori is saying, I think we all need to come. I think we need to go home, you know, because everybody's had a hard day. All right, here we go. My father, said Lucy, softly laying her hand on his. He slowly shook the shadow off and turned to her. Shall we go home, my father? With a long breath, he answered, yes. The friends of the acquitted prisoner had dispersed under the impression which he himself had originated that he would not be released that night. The lights were nearly all extinguished in the passages. The iron gates were being closed with a jar and a rattle and the dismal place was deserted until tomorrow morning's interest of gallows, pillory, whipping post, and branding iron should repeople it. Walking between her father and Mr. Darnay, Lucy Manette passed into the open air. A hackney coach was called, and the father and daughter departed in it. Mr. Stryber had left them in the passages to show his way back to the room. Another person who had not joined the group or interchanged a word with any of them but would be leaning against the wall where its shadow was darkest, had silently strolled out after the rest, and had looked on until the coach drove away. He now stepped up to where Mr. Lorry and Mr. Darnay stood upon the pavement. Okay, so who would be the only person um, who Mr. could Pontius. have joined the party of congratulating, but who instead is over here leaning against the wall? The man who was in the dark. Yeah. 
That's exactly right. What's his name? Do we know yet? Yes. Or we just heard him once or twice? I think Mr. Carton once. Okay. All right. So it's Mr. Carton. Good job. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's Mr. Carton. And now he comes over. Lucy's gone. Uh, Dr. Manette is gone. And so, Mr. Mr. Long. Stryver is gone, right? Yes, they're all gone. So it's just who? Mr. Lord, 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 Mr. Lord,
it tells us right now that he is uh, he's not quite sober. I thought he'd been in court all day. When would he have had an opportunity Before to go hour. out and drink? Uh, when they Before went on court. break. When they went on break for what? When the jury was so, When the jury was deliberating. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And you're going to see on this page that is confirmed. Yes. This is a strange chance that throws you and me together. This must be a strange night to you, standing alone here with your counterpart Underline on these counterpart. street stones. I hardly seem yet returned to Charles Downey to belong to this world again. I don't wonder at it. It's not so long since you were pretty far advanced on your way to another. You speak faintly. I begin to think I am faint. Then why the devil don't you die? I dined myself while those numbskulls were deliberating which world you should belong to, this or some other. Let me show you the nearest tavern to dine well at. Drawing his arm through his own, he took him down Ludgate Hill to Fleet Street, and so up a covered way into a tavern. Here they were shown into a little room where Charles Darnay was soon recruiting his strength with a good plain dinner and good wine, while Carton sat opposite to him at the same table with his separate bottle of port before him and his fully half-insolent manner upon him. Please underline separate bottle of port before him, half-insolent manner. Okay, half-insolent, insolent means smart aleck. And so, boy, you are really going to see the difference in these two guys. They may physically look, look somewhat like each other, but character-wise, they could not be farther apart. And so here you see that Mr. Darnay is having meal. I'm sure he is hungry. And so he's having his dinner and a glass of wine. Mr. Carton is not having food. He is having a bottle of pork, which is a bottle of wine. And he's going to have much more before the night's over. Do you feel yet that you belong to this terrestrial scheme again, Mr. Darnay? I am frightfully confused regarding time and place, but I am so far mended as to feel that. It must be an immense satisfaction. He said it bitterly and filled up his glass again, which was a large one. As, as to me, the, great the greatest desire I have is to forget that I belong to it. Is to forget that I belong to it. Who said that? Darnay. Darnay, the prisoner? Mr. Carton. That's right, Mr. Carton, the alcoholic. He oh. says, as to me, the greatest desire I have is to forget that I'm alive. And now look for, without playing the recording, please look for the only thing in life that gives him enjoyment. Wine. 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 To accept wine like this. So underline, accept wine like this. That's the only thing that he lives for. It has no good in it for me except wine like this, nor I for it. So we are not much alike in that particular. Indeed, I begin to think we are not much alike in any particular, you and I. Confused by the emotion of the day, and feeling his being there with this double, double of course, course deportment to be like a dream, Charles Darnay was at a loss how to answer. Finally, answered not at all. Okay, so I had you underline double of course deportment, I need to explain what course means. Well, first of all, why is double capitalized? Double means look alike, right? But why would it be capitalized? It's a specific person. You know, it's a proper noun. This double of course deport deportment is what he's calling Mr. Carton. So double means look alike, course means rude and crude, like a person who does not have good manners, deportment means behavior. So he's saying, it, Charles Dickens is telling us that it's kind of confusing for Charles Darnay to be talking with this double of course deportment. And he doesn't really know how to respond to Mr. Carton, so he's not gonna say anything. You will see in this whole section, which is just wonderful, that Charles Darnay has excellent manners. He's been raised well, 
and he is extremely polite and well-mannered. You know, back to the old, if y'all ever saw the Bambi movie where Thumper is saying, if you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. That's what Thumper says, and that's what just happened. Darnay didn't know how to respond politely, so he just kept his mouth shut. But Carton is a smart aleck, and he's going to try to pick a fight. Now your dinner is done, Carton presently said. Why don't you call a health, Mr. Darnay? Why don't you give your toast? What health? What toast? Why, it's on the tip of your tongue. It ought to be. It must be. I'll swear it's there. Miss Manette, then. Miss Manette, then. So they both, the, he says, hey, why don't you make a toast? Let's celebrate. And so finally, calls Darnay, because he does like her, he says, well, Miss Manette, then. And Carton raises his glass. Miss Manette, then. Now watch what he does. Looking his companion full in the face while he drank the toast, Carton flung his glass over his shoulder against the wall, where it shivered to pieces. Then he rang the bell and ordered in another. That's a fair young lady to hand her a coach in the dark, Mr. Darnley, he said, filling his new goblet. A slight frown and a laconic, yes, were the answer. That's a fair young lady to be pitied by and wept for by. How does it feel? Is it worth being tried for one's life to be the object of such sympathy and compassion? Mr. Darnay? Again, Darnay answered not a word. She was mightily pleased to have your message when I gave it her. Not that she showed she was pleased, but I suppose she was. Did you hear him say, was it worth being tried for your life to be looked at with such pity by that pretty little thing? Okay, can you, I'm hoping that you're able to follow this enough to tell that Carton is very jealous of Darnay. I hope you're able to see that he's envious about what? It has to do with Lucy. Is she showing the reaction? He was envious, yes, that Lucy looked at Charles Darnay with such pity. Do you remember when she says, oh, I hope, I'm trying to be a weak girl. I hope I may not repair him, repay him with heart today. Do y'all remember that? Yes. And so he's jealous that somebody feels such pity and concern for someone. The illusion served as a tiny reminder to Darnay that this disagreeable companion had, of his own free will, assisted him in the strait of the day. He turned the dialogue to that point and thanked him for it. So notice what happens. At this point, Mr. Darnay realizes, oh my word, I haven't even thanked uh, Mr. Carton. I haven't even thanked him for his part in the case today, because surely he must know that had it not been for that physical resemblance trick, Darnay would have never been gotten off the hook. And so at this point, he's thanking him for having helped him out. I neither want any thanks nor merit any was the careless rejoinder. It was nothing to do in the first place, and I don't know why I did it in the second. Okay, have you ever given a compliment, a sincere, heartfelt compliment? Maybe you haven't, but maybe you have given a heartfelt compliment to someone, and they just brush it off. Don't even, well, you keep living, and that's going to happen to you. You're going to be trying to give somebody a good compliment. Oh, I like it. Mr. Donnelly, let me ask you a question. Willingly, really, and a small return for your good offices. Do you think I particularly like you? Okay, he's not being romantic or anything like that. He's saying, Mr. Carton, the disagreeable companion, is saying, do you think I think that you're any big deal? Do you think I really think like, ooh, you're a respectful guy? Really, Mr. Carton, returned the other, oddly disconcerted, I have not asked myself the question, but ask yourself the question now. You have acted, you have acted as if you do, but I don't, but think, I don't think you do. I don't think I do, said Carton. I begin to have a very good opinion of your understanding. Nevertheless, pursued Dane, rising to ring the bell, there is nothing in that I hope to prevent my calling the reckoning and our parting without ill blood on either side. Okay, so underline calling the reckoning. What that term means is um, 
he's going to pay the bill at this time. He's going to call the waiter over and ask for the bill and he's gonna pay for it. Now, Sydney Carton is going to say, hey, are you going to pay for the whole thing like mine too? And when Mr. Darnay says, yes, I'm going to pay for the whole meal, then watch what Sydney Carton says. Carton will be joining nothing in life. Darnay rang. Do you call the whole reckoning? Said Carton. On his answer in the affirmative, then bring me another pint of this same wine drawer and come and wake me at 10. So what does he do when he finds out exactly? I want another bottle, right? Now, did we do this when somebody says, hey, I'm going to... No, you don't you say thank you. Exactly, okay. The bill being paid, Charles Darnay rose and wished him good night. Without returning the wish, Carton rose too, with something of a threat of defiance in his manner, and said, a last word, Mr. Darnay. You think I am you drunk? You think I am drunk? Okay, so those of us who have alcoholics in our family, or um, maybe you've had some exposure to this, I don't know. When someone with a drinking problem um, asks this question, do you think I'm drunk? It almost always escalates into yeah. a huge fight you know like if if it's your mom and dad and dad comes gets behind the wheel to start the car and mom says come out under her breath you're too drunk to drive and you know if dad asks oh you're saying i'm drunk things get out of hand really quickly because that is a statement that calls for a judgment to be made which is not good what i think you have been drinking Mr. Carton. See how Please. he responded, tried to respond tactfully. Well, I think you've been drinking. And now Carton's going to smart aleck. He's going to say, you know, think, you know I've been drinking. You know, just a <laughs> fight. I like her. You know I have been drinking. Oh. Since I must say so. I know it. Then you shall likewise know why. I am a disappointed drudge, son. I, I care, care for no man on earth. On no man on earth cares for me. No man on earth cares for me. I'm hoping you're forming an opinion of this guy. Much to be regretted. You might have used your talents better. Maybe so, Mr. Darnay, maybe not. Don't let, don't your, let your sober face elate you, however. You don't, you don't know what it may come to. That's F for foreshadowing. So when uh, Carton says, he's basically saying, you don't need to be so smug, sir you don't know how you're going to end up in life, right? Goodbye. When he was left alone, this strange being took up a candle, went to a glass that hung against the wall, and surveyed himself minutely in it. Okay, so this almost last paragraph, there are two left. In this paragraph, it is so important, because now there's only one person left, and that is Mr. Carton. And he takes this candle, because of course there's no electricity in this joint. He takes this candle, and he goes and looks at his face in the mirror. And so every ugly, hurtful thing he's about to say, he's talking to himself. Do you particularly like the man? He muttered at his own image. Why should you particularly like a man who resembles you? There is nothing in you to like, you know that. Ah, confound you. What a change you have made in yourself. A good reason for talking to a man is that he shows you what you have fallen away from and what you might have been. Underline that. He shows you what you have fallen away from and what you might have been. Change places with him. And would you have been looked at by those blue eyes as he was, and commiserated by that agitated face as he was? Come on, and have it out in plain words. You hate, you the, hate fellow. the fellow. He resorted to his pint of wine for consolation, drank it all in a few minutes, and fell asleep on his arms, with his hair straggling over the table, and a long winding sheet in the candle dripping down upon him. I'm turning off the camera because they do not need to know our opinions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I like cars. I want to